Hi, and welcome to episode two of Aperture Chat. Tom here from Aperture to Pixels. Ryan, from Plant Photography. And surprisingly, we are at episode two. Now, we're actually recording this before episode one goes on the air, because our video guy, uh, he's a little slow. But I'm okay with that. Better than me doing it. Oh, yes, much better. So, something big that's happened in the last week in the, uh, in the camera world, uh, I think there's some some camera company. <laughs> I'll reset that while you do the the, the Nikon. Um, some camera company that isn't Canon released some some new camera this week. There's been a bunch of new cameras, not, but you just don't pay attention to much things, do you? I pay attention to lots of things, but this is the one that's really a big deal. It's not a big deal for any of us or anybody that we know. We yeah, well, talk. so the new camera is the Nikon D4s, which is the upgrade for the Nikon D4, which is just kind of the. It's basically a standard upgrade for Nikon at this point. Um, they're looking at slightly better, it's mostly the same, the same sensor, same general body layout, some improvements to button layout. The big improvements are not things that people who wouldn't buy it would get. So the improvements include um, faster Ethernet, instead of base 100T, it's base 1000T megabit, instead of megabit, it's gigabit. Um, has the same, same CF and XQD layout that some people don't like. Has the same same sensor. The things that have improved are the ISO range and the video. Uh, the video, instead of being 1080p video at 30 frames a second, has improved to 60 frames a second at 1080p video. Uh, the ISO range has an increased high four mode now, which is 400,000 or so ISO, which is like night vision. Um, there's increased noise reduction. There's edge sharpening for high ISO performance. There's uh, split, they split up some of the buttons to make better optimization of layout. And there was one other slight thing. It was, oh yeah, the burst, there's a longer burst. So instead of say 75 raw files being burst in a row, it's over 100, so maybe it's 100 and 115 burst files. So if you don't already own a D4, you're not gonna really know any of these changes mean anything. But if you already own a D4, it's a pretty easy consideration to sell a D4, pay your extra $1,500 extra to end up with a D4S, end up with a top of the line camera. Yeah, other than that, it's the same pro camera that people expect. No, Welcome. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a, sounds like a, a, you know, a typical D, you know, four to four S. It's not a full new body or anything, but it does sound like, you know, a pretty decent jump forward as far as something Nikon's doing. What do you mean as far as something Nikon's doing? We'll as far as putting out a new flagship model, where Canon isn't putting out a new flagship model right now. True. So, yeah. so. That, that's, that's about it. All right. Well, that, that, that is the big news from the camera world right now that, that we care about. And I don't really care. I don't know why anyone who's not going to purchase one immediately is going to care. I don't think it's that technological of a jump to I really just, I just like new out. toys. It's not a toy. Okay, it's not a toy. I like new technology. I like new items. We I like have, to know what's going toys. on. We have toys. New new $6,000 pro cameras aren't exactly our toys. No, they're not our toys, but... All right, fine. They're not toys. But you know what I mean. I like the phrase, I like new toys. It makes me not feel quite so bad about spending so much money on cameras. Yeah, it's... You, oh, you spend a lot of money on cameras. <laughs> So go to the other end of the, of the spectrum. Um, I was uh, digging around and uh, found my old uh, Bell & Howell FD35 film camera that I used to shoot on as a kid. And even up through going into you know, adolescence, and even up until I bought my first digital camera. This was my camera of choice. Uh, it's here in the studio somewhere. I'm probably going to go dig it out. I forgot to grab it before we started recording. Uh, part of the reason I ended up going to Canon when I went digital is the Bell & Howell FD35 was a, basically it was the Canon TX1 knockoff made by Bell & Howell so they could produce it in Canada because Canon wouldn't let them produce it in Canada. <laughs> so it's exactly the same model as the uh, TX1. And, you know, I, I dug it out and I, I found the old lenses and the filters and everything and I really kind of missed for about 10 seconds shooting on film. And then I picked up my 6D and went, uh, oh, oh, wait, no, I like this much better. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it does bring up a lot of nostalgia shooting on film. And, you know, and actually the, the, the fun part was I, 
I was like, I want it advance. I want it advance. And I was taking pictures and I flipped open the thing and went, there's a roll of film still in here. I don't know when the last time I shot on that camera was. So we're going to have to get that developed and see what was on that roll of film because it's $24. I'm okay with that. I'm not. I'm okay with that because I know I haven't touched that camera in at least eight years. So I'm curious what's on there. I shot a roll of 35 recently just to run a roll of 35 and it's it worth a lot it? of money. No, it's never worth it. <laughs> not when you have a, a full frame 24 plus megapixel sensor. It's like there's not really an advantage. Well, no, it's I, interesting. I, it's fun. It's an art form, but. Yeah, that, that is definitely part of it, being an art form, not knowing what you have until you develop it. It's a, it's a totally different experience. So if you're starting out and you're shooting digital, and some people will tell you, oh, you have to go back and shoot film. You have to go back and shoot film. No, you don't. Those are the people who shot film. They just want you to suffer like they did. It's not worth it. The only thing you learn different is how to shoot in one ISO speed for a long time because you can't change your film halfway through. There are a lot of things you learn shooting 35 millimeter film that would help you with shooting digital, but it's never something you'd want to do for anything you're going to produce. It's... No. If you're, if you're trying to produce stuff, if you're trying to produce an image, you're trying to produce a final product, it's, um, it's painful to start going into. It takes a long time to get used to. It takes a long time to process stuff now. If you, um, you have to wait a week. You have to wait a week or two. It's not, yeah. there aren't 35 millimeter processing you just drop off and... Yeah, one hour photo is gone. I yeah, mean, it's, it's one thing if you're shooting uh, quarter 20, like big film, like quarter 20, uh, four four by six frames or something that's a whole different or, or those giant polaroid 1820 well yeah, eight by tens are even bigger but yeah if you're shooting a 35 there's not really a reason to no no there really isn't you should go for it shoot the ten dollar frames but no, it was a little nostalgia it came up it's nice i, I do it occasionally yeah and it is kind of neat because even though i've got modern digital you know equipment I do have the adapter ring that lets me put the old lenses onto my new cameras. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't played with that enough yet. No, but the fact that everything is totally manual, it's actually really funny. I'll have to catch a video of what the back of the screen looks like. Because if you've ever looked at the back of your camera and you can see, like, every setting, you know, if you put it in manual, how it's just, like, M, but you still control every setting? This just shows you nothing. Because it doesn't know the aperture. It doesn't, you know, the only thing it controls is the shutter speed. It doesn't know anything else about what's going on. And it, it's just kind of entertaining to look at. But some of those old lenses are so nice. I mean, I've, I've got, the, you know, the one telephoto in there I've got is probably nicer than any other lens I own. And, I mean, it's from the 70s. It weighs about 10 tons, but... I, I, work, I work for a photographer who has uh, 8x10 plus optics that just kind of sit and collect dust because you can't use them for anything. And nobody's going to buy them for anything worth anything. Yeah. There's no, nobody's going to spend money on these you know, German handmade optics that are better than most things because they're not worth that. And if people yeah. don't use them to make money, if you don't use them to make money, you can't spend money on them unless yeah. you're crazy. It's unfortunate. It really is. It's, it is. It's unfortunate there's so much of this tech out there that is probably better than what you could buy now, but there's just no way to use it anymore. Well, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of lens technology has come so far, it's tough to say that now. That's true. I mean, the... the it was true 10 years ago. 10 well, yeah. years ago, lens tech was really crappy for a lot of the digital stuff. Compared to what the old 35 yeah. better frames were. And, that, and that's why there's so many of these adapter rings from the old Canon EF to the EOS, or the EF, the FD to the um, EF adapter rings exist because back then, you know, 10 years ago, people were more than happy to still use the old FD lenses. But now you have, you know, the Canon, you know, the new L, you know, the L series over the last 10 years, the, well, you guys don't have a definition in Nikon, but well, it's just, just the Nikon lenses, lenses, the, just the pro the lens lenses. Pretty much. They've come so the far. The that, you know, it, it, well, and it's, I mean, the, the growth of Sigma and Tamron in the last oh, yeah. five years is a big thing, too. Yeah, it's, I mean, my, my 2470 is a Sigma, which I picked up because you've got yours, and I loved yeah, it. Our 2470 is the, the Sig, the new EXDF, whatever. HSM, whatever. I don't know. It's not HSM. Alpha. It's not HSM? No. I don't know. I don't, you need, a, like, a checklist for these just to, like, have in your pocket to see the... The designations for lenses are getting ridiculous. The, the, they are getting ridiculous. And Sigma keeps adding letters. The new yeah. art lenses are like the same that designations, just with the word A, letter A at the end. <laughs> just more designations for no reason. Yeah, well, well I mean, the, nec the next lens I'm picking up is, my, is, is a Tamron. I, I never thought I would be buying a Tamron lens. 
and now over over a cannon directly. over a, over a cannon lens of the same size, same aperture, same everything. And I'm gonna be picking up the the Tamron when I pick up the 7200. It's it just I've played with both of them now, and unless I go all the way out to the top of the line and buy the brand new L series IS2 7200, it's just not worth it. Uh, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm not the, I don't have, you know, $3,200 to throw down right now. It's really $3,200? With insurance. Really? Yeah. It's 26 normally. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. But if you buy, like, the five-year insurance plan on it... I wouldn't. That would... I probably wouldn't either, just because... I would say you don't even consider it. The, the reason that they cost so much money is that they're impossible to break. This is true. That's, that's why a 4DS is $6,000, because if you... you they're hard to break to begin with, and if you do break them, Nikon can fix it in 20 minutes in front of you. Yeah. They're, they're all modular. The, the, the 1DX is the same way. The, guy, the, the, the one guy I know, one of my fraternity brothers, he's a photojournalist out in, uh, in Wyoming, and he has two 1DXs. I mean, this is how he makes his living, so having $12,000 of just body hanging off of him doesn't bother him. And then, you know, one's got a 2470, the other's got the 7200 on it, so he never misses a shot, you know, but he... He captures rodeos and football games, and you know he's out there doing everything. And he's like, "Yeah, I just throw my one DXs in a duffel bag. They don't have any protection." No. And I'm like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, they're gonna take a beating. Yeah, that that's what they do. They take a beating and they work." And he's like, "Plus, if anyone ever went through my bag, these things are beat up. They're gonna look at it and go, nobody wants this camera." Yeah, that's that's true of every every photojournalist I've ever seen. It's just it's, it's like, a duffel bag or a backpack. It's yeah, and they're like, oh, nobody's going to steal this camera because it's, it's beat up. Well, if you, it breaks, Nikon will be at your feet to fix it anyway, or Canon. They'll, yeah. they'll just fix it. It's because you're, yeah. you're a pro, pro-level pro photographer. Yeah, absolutely. Although, what I did ask him, you know, when I was looking at buying the, the current camera, he was, uh, he was like, no, 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 just break, you know, he, 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 like Matt Norris, told me the same thing. Just break the bank and buy the 5D Mark III. Guess I, I, I don't have that much money. <laughs> That's how I ended up on the 6D, but it's a just nice basic, camera. Just don't have enough money. Yeah. It doesn't work. They're like, yeah, but you'll make it back. I'm like, maybe in a long time. <laughs> so we were talking about just insane amounts of letters that are on these lenses. And so that, that kind of, we, we've had a real good day of segues so far. That leads us into uh, the next topic I wanted to hit on. And we didn't do this on purpose. We're really not this creative. Um, which is speak for yourself. Okay, I'm not this creative with words. Um, the question for us to debate here: Do you really need IS, VC, VR, or OS, which are all the same thing? It's image stabilization if you're on Canon. It's vibration correction. VC is what Sigma. Yeah, is the Sigma because VR is vibration reduction. That's the Nikon, and OS, which is optic stabilization for Tamron. It's it's the the technologies are probably different because they've all developed them independently, but they all achieve the same thing. There's two or three base technologies they all share, though. They are, yeah. they are actually kind of similar. So, so my question that we, for one of our, our two questions to kind of sit here and debate a little bit is, do you need it? It's, this, there's, it's just with any kind of camera thing, there's a thousand factors for that. Um, a lot of it has to do with the lens. Like, our 2470... Sigmas are non-VR lenses. At a wide aperture, I mean, at a wide focal length, so between 24 and 70, the lens is wide, you can usually be shooting quick enough to compensate for your vibration. But I would never purchase a 70 to 200 without vibration reduction, because they're impossible to counter for. You need to be shooting at 400th of a second most of the time to yeah. compensate. So the old, old rule of thumb is double your focal length for your acceptable shutter speed while shooting to reduce vibration. So that's, you know, at 200 millimeters, that's 400th of a second. That's fast. That's, that's just faster than you can ever shoot with a flash, usually, if you yep. don't run Pocket Wizard or another high-speed sync. Even with device. them, I mean, that's still... It's fast. It's, it's a little too fast. With VR, you can knock that down to... I mean, depending on your VR system, you can go down to 10th of a second. If you're very still and you have the right VR, 10th of a second's not out of the question. Yeah. So you can get a lot more range. I mean, but, I, I know... I, I know with the uh, the Tamron one, the, they claim one full stop. You can it's actually do much, stop. but it's it's much more than that. They claim three stops. The new no. the Tamron one is three stops. Um, oh, the new one? Yeah, 
the new Tamron one is three stops versus the, the new Oh, the old Tamron one is one stops, yeah. Yeah, you'd never do one stop. That's the, the Tamron that you're looking at is three stops. It's three stops. And so I, instead of having to shoot at 400th of a second, I can come down 200, 100. I can shoot at a 50th of a second. Now, that's pretty reasonable. That's better than I shoot handheld on my 2470 because I shoot that at, you know, 60, 80, hundredth of a second typically. So, yeah, it... Is it worth it? Yeah, if you've got a long lens, then and you're not shooting on a tripod. Well, that's only so true. If you have a lens that's past 200 millimeters, you're shooting on a tripod anyway. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. You know, now you're shooting on a tripod, so is it necessary? Maybe not. So yeah, if you're shooting, you know, landscapes or on a 500 millimeter lens, you're you, you're on a tripod. There's no way. Trust me, I've landscapes. picked up a 500 millimeter lens. You're holding it like a freaking rifle. You're like, uh, okay. Even and normal tripods don't work for like past past the three hundred millimeter. You need you need a gimbal head tripod, which is yeah. a certain balanced tripod. So, but if you're asking us for advice, you're probably not shooting on those lenses anyway. So you never know. It's wildlife <laughs> photography. It's easy avenue for people to end up with gear that they potentially would have a hard time using setup wise. Because you can rent you can rent a three hundred millimeter lens, five hundred oh, millimeter yeah. lens for hundred dollars for a week while camping. Which, if I have the cash, I am. I am definitely renting. You rent. I, I am definitely renting a big lens if I'm going I, camping. If, well, if I'll I have, have the cash. It's I'll, I'll have the 7200 by then, but I was considering getting... Um, uh, Tamron this week released a 5... Well, I shouldn't say they released it this week. Uh, I just saw it this week. They probably released it like six months ago because I'm slow like that. A 500 5.6? It's a 5.6. But if you shoot... You know, if I'm shooting, you know, landscape... You know, why do you need a telephoto for landscapes? I didn't make fun of you for that quick enough. Or wildlife or anything. You I don't five, shoot six, landscapes with a 500 millimeter lens. I would from the top of Mount Washington. No, you wouldn't. I would. No, you wouldn't. Because you'd have to stitch 35 pictures together and it wouldn't work. It's so little frame, you would never do that. But I want to get the other mountain far away. No, you don't use <laughs> telephotos for landscapes. It doesn't, doesn't really work like that. It's, I mean, the telephoto lenses are very specific in what you need them for. It's wildlife or sports. So there's not really another thing mm. past 300 millimeters at f2.8, which is a portrait lens you can use yeah. to shoot high-end portraiture. You don't need the big lenses. It just, there isn't another use for them, really. No, there really isn't. They're too awkward. They're extremely it, awkward, extremely it, heavy. It really was. Actually, the, uh, the review, I was reading the, the woman who was reviewing it, was standing next to the lens. Yeah. Like she was holding it down her side and it was like three quarters of the length of her leg with the camera resting on her hip. It was an obnoxious lens. Oh, you need a suitcase. That's the thing. You, oh yeah, this it comes, comes with a suitcase. With, it comes in a hard suitcase. It, com it comes with the hard suitcase. That was part of the review. They're like, and here's a suitcase. And you're like, huh? Okay. Big, giant, hard suitcase. I love it. That's the problem with renting a lens is that I know the place I want to shoot the lens is about a mile in, by a mile hike in. Yep. So that's a mile hike in with two camera bodies, at least a giant suitcase of a lens, a, a gimbal head tripod, which I've also rented, which weighs 10 pounds by itself, and then whatever else I'm gonna need at the crack of dawn. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those, you set up and you stay there for six hours. You don't move. You sit on that rock for six hours, waiting for the moose to yep. come trotting along. And then if you're like me, the moose comes way too close for the big lens and you're scrambling for your other lens. And <laughs> Well, I that's was, why you'll have two bodies, one with the you know, 500 and one with the 7200 on it. So you, when the moose gets too close, you'll be like, ha ha, I planned for you, moose, click. That was very funny. I, with, that's an actual experience of another photographer that I met on a rock out in Maine in the middle of nowhere. So with crack of dawn, we're out underneath Mount Katahdin in Baxter State Park. Um, my father and I, we have just kind of normal two, two 300 millimeter cameras. And the person that we met on the rock had been there since, since dawn. We, we were a couple hours later than he was. And he had on a gimbal head tripod, a big Sigma 500 millimeter with a teleconverter, I think. He was, he oh, was wow. taking pictures of people on summiting Katahdin on the top of the mountain, laughing. Like, oh, this guy just made it up to the top of the mountain. Um, so as we sat there for a little while and we, we were talking. So we don't leave right away. We sit around for the longer and longer waiting for the moose to come trotting by. And eventually when the moose does come by, it starts way off on the other side of the lake. And he's taking his pictures, and he's, he's getting his pictures. Then slowly, it's a mom and a baby moose, which a baby moose is still eight feet tall. Mom and baby come over, slowly. And mama stops, finds something she likes to eat. 
baby moose decides that he wants to figure out what that clicking noise is and just keeps coming over until he is within the focal distance of my 300 millimeter, which is five feet. So it's at some point the moose just came over, look, chew and eaten, and the guys, I see the guy taking bodies off of lenses and he's using, just taking lens off of body and body off of lens and freaking out. And it's one of the best wildlife experiences you'll ever have, but it was very funny watching the man with the big ass lens not be able to do what he needed to do. <laughs> which on my Flickr, which I think is uh, rps, flickr.com slash rps, r-p-e-a-s-e, there is a main set, which is hilarious, because it's moose way out, moose way out, moose, moose, bugs on moose, bugs on moose, and then leaving again, <laughs> complete with videos. It, it is a pretty interesting set. I would definitely go check that out. So, yeah, yeah the, so, get, getting out in, the, out in the field, definitely going to want some big lenses. This yeah, it, it's but, especially fixed prime. Oh, yeah. Telephoto versus Zoom telephoto. Well, 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 we'll get to that in a minute. We got one, one thing in between there. Oh, I would have just completely skipped that, but continue. No, we, we, we can skip it. That's fine. That's well, fine. No, you, you say, touched on it early, along I the way, it, too. So. Along, so. That's so. Your, your, your venue anyway. This is my venue, the, the, but I do want to throw, throw it out there, and then we can chat about this a little bit. Uh, our, our next point we want to kind of just touch on is for shooting portraits, since we were talking about shooting wildlife and, and making fun of me about uh, landscape, uh, but, but shooting portraits, you know, is it a good place for a prime lens or a zoom lens? And I don't have a whole lot of prime lenses because prime lenses, although they're really, really nice, also really, really expensive. Uh, well, the ones I want. That's the issue. You can buy very acceptable prime lenses for your non-professional cameras, Extrem extremely cheap. Yes. Yeah. The 50 millimeter 1.8, line is that's a lens you should own and they're usually $150 or less yeah, for the no, ones you, that you would buy. You, if you walk into a camera store and you shoot Canon and you say I want the nifty 50 that's what they're going to hand you. It's going to be that 50 millimeter 1.8 and what's crazy is there's three 50 millimeter primes that Canon makes. They make the 1.8, a 1.4 which is like their semi-pro line and then they make the L which is a 1.2 and they used to make a 1.0 and oh, I've seen pictures taken with that 1.0. It's like, hi, your eyes in focus, but your eyelashes aren't. The depth of field is so shallow on it. But everything behind you is gone. The bokeh is just insane on it. it it's like porn. Um, but that 1.8 actually is, at 2.8, it's actually better than the 1.4 is. It's actually a little bit nicer. So not too many people buy the 1.4 anymore. They just buy the, the Nifty 50, even though it's a little more plasticky. It's less... You know, then people are like, oh, well, you gotta buy it because it's you know, this and that. It's like, no, it, it works great. I have one, I love it. Um, and it does, it gets you some really, really nice pictures at 2.8 because that's really where it dials in real tight and that, that's great for taking portraits. Um, I'd love to have an 85. I mean, that, that would be my dream lens right now, would be that 85 1.2 that Canon makes in the L series. Uh, plus I just want a red ring lens. I just want the red ring. Marketing. It's marketing. Oh, yeah, it's totally marketing. But, you know, if you have an Xbox, you don't want the red ring. I, I want the red ring because it's Canon. Yeah, but at the same time, the Sigma is the one I would buy at 50, 50 millimeter. Sigma is making the best 50 millimeter they, made on the, really, the planet at this they, point. They it's, really are making the best 50 mil I mean, right if, now. If everything that they say about the art, the Sigma 50 millimeter 1.4 art is true. Yeah then it's the best 50 millimeter 1.4. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I already Even have my... The Zeiss, which is yeah, oh, German, well, German. Yeah, if you're going Carl Zeiss, that, that, that's a whole different league. I, no, not according to what they're saying about this stuff. Really? They're saying it's as sharp as and more contrast than the, the, the Zeiss Opus or whatever it is. Wow. Yeah. That, that is just wow. Well, I mean, the, the, the video Sigma's been putting up on YouTube of like, their production methods and everything, you really start looking at it and going, you know, these guys are serious. So that makes sense. I mean, that's a great video. Have you seen that yet? No, I haven't seen the Sigma they, production They put stuff. two of them up now. Um, they're two five-minute videos, and they, I think they're going to do four in total. They, like, interview people from the plant who work on the production line. They talk to the president. They show you actually, they go in with a camera into the clean rooms that they actually built, you know, grind the lenses down on. It's actually a really cool video. And, it, and they make them in Japan. It's not, you know, Sigma's not made in China. It's made in Japan. And so part of it is, like, just the beautiful landscape around the building. They chose the location not because it was good for, um, 
for production or logistics? Well, because they wanted the people coming in to be inspired when they came into work, that the landscape should inspire them to make great lenses. And I guess the people who've been there have been there like, since, since the company started. It's amazing how far they've come. It's, they always used to make a halfway decent lens and a terrible lens, and they're yeah. responsible for some of the worst lenses ever made by mankind, I think. <laughs> well, that's why it was so hard for me to buy this Sigma. It yeah, Because I'd had bad Sigma lenses in the past, and... I've played with, and same thing with Tamron. Tamron has made yeah. some pretty terrible well, that, that's lenses. That's why I'm so shocked I'm going to buy that, that 7200. Yeah, they, they, they've both come to be right up in league with the Nikon and Tamron, the Nikon and Canon. Canon. Yeah. It's, so, and I, I haven't gone looking at their 85s yet, but I'm actually kind of excited to start looking at their 85s because that is, that is like the portrait lens for portrait photographers. And, and so I'm, I don't think they've come up with an 85 art yet. I think that's still the next one in the line. I think that, that is the next one for Sigma. I think Tamron makes an 85 Prime. I'm not. That's going to be expensive. It is. Well, they're all going to be expensive. 85 Primes are always expensive. Well, the art series in general is actually pretty expensive, but. Yeah. Well, they're, they're realizing they can compete with the Canon L series. And well, it's, they're also expensive to make, but yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean, but they can compete. They don't have to worry about undercutting them a whole lot because they're actually getting the quality up there to be able to do it. So that, that, that's my next lens is, is an 80, you know, after the 7200, I'm talking like a year out at this point, unless I start taking a lot more portraits all of a sudden, uh, would be the 85 prime and it, it might be the Sigma art by then. Yeah, I think they're probably six months to a year out of Sigma 85 art. Which is good, because I'm like six months to a year out of buying an 85, so. <laughs> it's not too high on my list. Uh, I need a 50 millimeter prime. Yep. Well, that'd be I, good for weddings. Uh, it's not. No? It's not. It's, I mean, weddings are really, if you're going to switch lenses, you need a good reason to switch lenses. That's true. I, and most of the time, I'm not going to switch to a 50 prime. The one I would switch to for a couple of things is a 100 millimeter macro. Oh, yeah. It's a Nikkor 100, 100 millimeter 2.8 macro. That's long enough with the 2.8 where I would use it be able to do both macro and portraits with. Yep. The 50 is a little short for the way I shoot usually. The 50 macro is a little short in general. I own one. I use it for shooting miniature models. Yeah. Like, because at the Temple Games, you know, they've got the miniature wargaming, and I'll get guys after they're done playing, hey, can I get some pictures? I'll line it up on the table. And it, it's a 2.5, which I thought was a little odd. It is. But it looks great at 2.8. I mean, you still, you get a little vignetting, but you can account for that. But it takes great pictures of, but you, you're this close. I mean, you're like inches away. I mean, it's hyperfocal distance is like six inches. So you're right on top of it. Yeah, I think the 100 millimeter is what, nine inches? Yeah. Well, like at least that. the Canon one is. Cause yeah, I, no, that's I, the same. I borrowed Matt Norris's for a little while, for about an hour. And, ah. Uh, yeah, they're very nice. I, they're very nice. The Nikon one is sharper. It is. Um, I, I won't deny that. The Nikon one is sharper. $300 less. <laughs> I, won't, I won't deny that the Nikon uh, it's, macro is a little sharper. They, I, they usually are, but it's it's um, they're all very good. I think the hundred millimeter macro range is very useful. Yeah, no, I, I, that's where I'd like to be working in macro. So I might have to. Oh yeah, we'll spin our cans out there. Although we are not sponsored by Narragansett Brewing Company, they should sponsor us if anyone's watching and can contact them. It's cheap enough. <laughs> it's also just what we always happen to have in the fridge around here. Um, but yeah. No, but, but for shooting portraits, I like, I would love to shoot more on primes if I had them. The 50, I, I did quite a bit. I just, we just did a, a video this week that maybe we'll get up in the next month or so if we can get around to editing it. But we got a lot of, a lot of good footage and a lot of good stuff. Uh, I shot that on the 50, uh, on the 50 prime. Uh, well, I shot the photos I took on it, I shot on the 50 prime. The video itself, we actually shot on the 2470. Let's keep going. Uh, so, yeah, it's as much as primes are nice. Um, a lot of the stuff I do is event shooting, so for me to purchase a prime, it needs to be a very specific thing that I couldn't do already, and the macro fulfills that. I can't get the magnification that I could get with a macro. So to you know, I would actually need a macro lens to do to do a lot of the shots I would like to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Other than that. You have to be careful with the, what zooms you purchase too. Uh, it's, we use the general pros zooms are 2.8 aperture zooms. So you get a lot of light. 
you can use your focal distance properly. My boss, who's been shooting weddings for you know longer than almost longer than my parents have been born, um, he he loves his twenty four to one hundred five or twenty four to one twenty Nikon lens, which to me you get a lot of downsides. There's some vignetting. There's a lot of distortion. There's stuff that isn't isn't worth it. There's not worth having that extra distance. But for him, the ease of having a long zoom at an event makes a huge difference and he wants to use those more often. I would much rather be able to have my 24 to 70 and then switch to my 70 to 200 when I actually want the distance. But I guess that's a little too much work for him. I blame the Brits. And I have lots of actual definition for this. The only reason our SLRs are limited to 30, 29 minutes and 59 seconds of video at any given time is because in the UK, if a camera can record more than, if it can record 30 minutes or more of video, it's classified as a camcorder and it's taxed completely differently. And so that you can't even import one that will do that, they made them worldwide 29 minutes and 59 seconds. So. In case you're curious why we have to keep getting up and resetting the cameras uh, until we buy something like an Atomos, but I don't have 400 bucks lying around to throw up one of those. How many feeds does it take in anyway? I guess it depends on one. the one. Yeah, so. Yeah, we'd have to buy one for each camera. That's gonna happen. Yeah, I'm more likely to go out and buy a actual camcorder, like an HD camcorder. It would be nice to have the capture device. Oh yeah. As there's plenty of things that we can do with capture devices that you can't do with just a camcorder, but. Oh yeah, no, I, I would love to get an Atomos. Maybe they'll send us one. I mean, they sent one to Jared Bolin, but he uses their shit. Yeah, use that comparison, please. <laughs> that, that's a comparison you get to make. I'd never get to make that comparison. I just want to meet the guy. I just want to meet the guy. His just studio funny. is like 10 miles from where my parents live. Oh, just, yeah, you have an actual reason. I have an actual reason to go to Philadelphia. It's and actually, I was going to go do one of his uh, photo tours. He, apparently, he does them around the city all the time. I was like, ah, go down and do that. It was like the weekend after I went to go visit my parents a couple of months ago. It's like, I'm not coming down again for another weekend. <laughs> so we have two questions. Two questions that, that uh, I've been asked recently, and I figure we should address them here. Probably a little better than, you know, me just dealing... Well, I've, I've explained these to the people already, but they are good questions to have out here, and in this way, kind of gives you guys a lead-in who are... who may or may not actually be watching us or listening to us in the background as you're doing actual work. Uh, remember, you can ask us questions. We'll, ad we'll address them here on the, on the podcast. Uh, so the first question that I have here is uh, from one of the people in my office. This actually, using last week, remember I talked about the woman I helped with the, uh, with the Olympus. Uh, this actually was a question she ended up asking me, which was, uh, what's the difference between Zoom and telephoto? I thought they were the same thing. They're not. Nope. <laughs> um, and the reason I think people get confused with this is the fact that you see the W and the T, and if you actually go look it up, it's wide and telly. Yeah. And I'm like, Don't, you're confusing people. Don't do that. Because um, telephoto just refers to the fact that it's a longer lens. And zoom is actually the ability to change. So zoom and prime are the opposites, not zoom and, you know, and so you can have a prime telephoto lens, and you can have a wide zoom lens. Yeah, you can have a wide, a wide zoom, a normal, a normal zoom, a tele, and a tele zoom. Yep. It's all okay. And so they're not the same thing, but the, the, the quick definition is if you can change how far you can zoom, that's a zoom lens. Otherwise, it's a prime lens it's if it's fixed. And telephoto just refers to the fact that it's, you can get that shot that's really far away from you. So that's our, our, our quick hit on that question. And the other one, which is a little more controversial, but I think we're in agreement on this one, is uh, should I invest in a photo printer? It, no. It's, it's one of those subjects that it's, unless you've really worked with photo printers a lot, you don't know why there's such an issue. But any printer that uses that many different cartridges is probably going to be more of an issue than it's worth for just general use. I know it's if you use a lot of office, office kind of stuff, if you're printing a lot of documents, having a, a printer with eight different cartridges is probably going to be a pain in the butt because the black 
cartridge is the same size as the other eight. Yeah, it's actually kind of annoying here. Yeah, it's. Uh, they could oftentimes be built better and maybe last a little longer, but they're not built to handle a large volume of documents. They're built to be able to print large and print high quality color images, and they're also more expensive. It's yeah, no, I mean our, our our photo printer here we use for everything, and eventually we should probably invest in. Uh, a non-photo printer for like documents and stuff. Yeah, we don't we don't print out a ton of documents. Yeah, so we, right, we don't go through a ton of documents, which is why we haven't done that yet. Um, but yeah, like like Ryan said, I I totally agree with him on this one. I may disagree with him all the time, but this is one where we can agree. If, if you're buying a photo printer, it's because you need to print your photos. If you if you don't need to print your photos on the fly right now, right here, then go to Walgreens. Go to CVS. Or go to an actual print studio. Or go it's, to a real print studio. I already reset it's this. It's not cheaper. It's potentially not much cheaper to print than going to an outside person, going yeah. to an actual actual place that does photo printing. What it lets you do is proof. It lets you proof larger prints before you actually send them for an expensive print. So if I, if I want to print a big 20 by 30, like there are some 20 by 30s in the studio, each one of those prints is t between 20 and $40, depending on how much you spend, where you get them printed. I can spend $4 here printing a good size proof, make sure the color is right and I like the print before I send it out. If you're not doing that, you're cheaper just sending it out in the first place and not spending the first proofing money. Yeah, and a lot of the places that you can send to out of house can do color correction. Yeah, it's... So, I mean, where we are, we, we tell them, no, we are telling, sending you the true colors, this is what we want, don't color correct. But a lot of the places will color correct if there's, you know... If, I mean, if, you're, if your white is just slightly off, they'll fix it for you. I mean, we're, where we're going, you know, we're telling them, no, we are dead on where we want it to be. This is the color we want. Take it. So they won't color correct for us because we ask them not to. And, but, yeah, being able to print the proof is huge for us. I mean, yeah. Or, or client things. It's the same thing. It's the same yeah. thing. You're doing things for a client. You want a couple of 4x6s or a couple of 8x10s quickly. Doing them here is very good. It's nice service. But yeah, it's a pain in the butt. And... You know, even though we've got a nice, really nice Epson color printer, setting them out always looks better, anyway. So, yeah, uh, it's it's printers are big mechanical machines that are prone to breaking. No matter what you do to them, after a little while, they will break, and they will be worth more money than they're worth. They change so quickly. Once it breaks, it's just a giant waste of money. Yeah. So it's you know you're investing this money. It's going to break after a couple of years, and you're going to be have paid this much money to have a printer for that many years, and have to buy a new one. Yeah, I mean, they don't I, last forever. It's just how they work. Yeah, I mean, even I, good ones don't last forever. Yeah, and Sorry. one one thing that that I've run into personally is I had bought a, I would just call it entry level. I mean, it was a, it was a photo printer. It could take photo paper and everything. Um, but one thing I found this is the one I use at home now. It won't take photo paper anymore. The wheels have dried out. They don't grip it right. It doesn't push right. So it's something you also have to maintain properly. I never maintained it. I was like, oh, I've never had a problem with a printer. Still works great on plain paper. Works okay on card, you know, on card stock. But if I put a four by six sheet in there like I used to do, I, it, it'll miss the first half inch of the photo because it can't push it all the way up because the wheels are, are out of, you know, they're all dried out and cracked and they don't grip properly. So Consider that if you're going to buy a photo printer that you got to do a lot of maintenance on it that you're not even thinking about. So that, that's another reason why I would say, no, don't invest in a photo printer unless, yeah. unless you're doing, you know, like, like Ryan said, unless you need proofs and you're doing it all the time, don't bother. Yeah, or you expect to actually use it quite a bit. I yeah. know I've watched our friend Grant Garvin destroy printers in creative ways I didn't think were possible. I've seen printers just break, new printers, just out of the box just break because they don't like him, apparently. Printers are very finicky. They're, it's not something you want to invest in unless you're ready to actually deal with having a printer, yeah. honestly. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, it's nice to have one. That's the thing. It is, it is nice to be able to proof stuff in a studio. But and, other than that, I can't think of a reason to own one. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, and there are other large format printers that are not photo printers that you could use. If, if your whole reason is, well, I want to be able to print 13 by 19, there are other printers I can do 13 by 19 that are not photo printers and will probably stand up a little better. Well, the ink is always expensive, too. Yeah, it depends on what, what levels I mean. you're doing. And 
photo ink that isn't necessarily more expensive. There's just more of them. Yeah, instead of your, you know, like I look at the at the the large format printer I have at, at the office at work, and it it's the standard four colors: CMYK, you know, the, the black, cyan, magenta, and yellow. The one we have here has like eight cartridges in it. Is it I thought it, you know, it was eight. It's eight. It's ridiculous. It's it's a bit much, but and, it, they're, they're really nice. Yeah, it does a very good job. So, but that one, you know, it's it's the regular four cartridges. It's not. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, shouldn't say it's not photo quality because I've have printed proofs there in the past before we had this one, but you know, you, you're better off with something like that. And I know it's a lot cheaper to run than what we have. So yeah, all right. I think we're we're good. I think we're good for this week. And thank you for watching. Remember, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We have Apture Chat. We've got some product reviews. We've got some other videos in the works. So you know, the Bucket Castle photo. YouTube channel will be all sorts of fun stuff. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. and and same thing for Bucket Castle Labs, which will be my weird, just random thoughts. I'm really actually excited for Bucket I, Castle yeah, Labs. I have no idea. It's 4 a.m. drunk. It's what it, a lot of it is. It's what That's you, what, what makes you do it fun. With it. It's hopefully. <laughs> They're just weird videos. I'll put some stuff up there. I'm sure. Should be fun. I think most of my time lapse stuff is going to end up on your Pocket Castle Labs. Yeah, it's anything we think is just going to be terrible in the first place. Which is why. Well, we think this is going to be terrible, but it's going to be its own thing of terrible <laughs> for a while. This, this is going to be terrible until we figure out what the hell we're doing. It's always going to be terrible. <laughs> well, let's hope it's not always terrible because I want to get guests in here at some point. Being terrible is just fine. You don't understand <laughs> the internet. I understand the internet. I just don't want to be terrible. Everything's terrible. Uh, I dropped my you other stop beer. dropping beer. I knocked over my other beer. Well, okay, anyway. and that, that's a good reason for us to stop because I'm knocking over beers. We'll see you next week. Good night.